their idle and entient way of life. What Lord Berry saw across the heather through the sleet was the last feudal army to assemble in Britain. He could have felt no more kinship with it than an officer of Victoria's army would later feel when surveying a Zulu, Impi, or a tribe of Patton to any Englishman of the 18th century. And to most lowland Scots, the highlands of Scotland were a remote and unpleasant region peopled by barbarians who spoke an obscure tongue, who, dressed in skins or bolts of party coloured cloth, and who equated honour with cattle stealing and murder. The savagery with which in the lowland Scots and the English were to suppress the rebellion is partly explained by this belief. It is being a common assumption among civilised men that brutality is pardonable when exercised upon those they consider to be uncivilised. The Highlanders were a constant threat to the people of the lowlands, or were believed to be. In England, very little was known of them. Their mountains were a week or two weeks from London by fast horse. The government was as prejudiced and as ill-informed as the people, although in a man like Duncan Forbes, Lord President of the Court of Session, it had a sober and sensible adviser on Highlands affairs, did it choose to use him. From the windows of his noble house at Culloden, below Dramossi Moor, he watched the mountain people with a critical eye, and only occasionally looking down his long nose. He was sincerely concerned with the need to bring to them the soft and civilising influence of the South, and when he was severe in his judgments, it was with parental disapproval. One day in the summer of 1746, when the rebellion was over and the government was taking steps to see what there should see that there should not be another, Duncan Forbes sat down and penned a thoughtful essay on what was and what might be now that the blood had been let. It contained a sharp picture of his wild neighbours. What is properly called the Highlands of Scotland is that large tract of mountainous ground to the northwest of the Tay, where the natives speak the Irish language, the inhabitants stick close to their ancient and idle way of life, retain their barbarous customs and maxims, depend generally on their chiefs as their sovereign lords and masters, and being accustomed to the use of arms and inured to hard living are dangerous to the public peace and must continue to be so until being deprived of arms for some years, they forget the use of them. The feudal framework which the power of the chiefs gave to the Highland way of life enclosed a tribal system much older in time. The ties of blood and name were strong among the people, and pride of race meant as much to a humbly in his sod and round stone house, as it did to a chieftain in his island keep. All claimed lines of gentility, and the meanest of them believed himself the superior of any soft breeched creature living south of his hills. By 1746, however, the clan society was dying, and for once history was to show an appreciation of dramatic effect by ending it abruptly and brutally. For more than a hundred years, the politics and the economy of the South had been entering the glens. Military roads driven through the highlands from garrison to garrison and sea to sea broke cracks across the hard geography of the land. But still, the past lingered behind its defence work of the Irish tongue. The memories kept alive by pipes and the songs. The clan remained a man's only identity, and the broadsword his only understandable law outside it. A Highland clan, wrote old Duncan Forbes, is a set of men all bearing the same surname and believing themselves to be related the one to the other and to be descended from the same common stock. In each clan there are several subaltern tribes, who own their dependence on their own immediate chiefs, but all agree in owing allegiance to the supreme chief of the clan or kindred, 
and look upon it to be their duty to support him at all adventures. No law of the country, none put down on sheepskin anyway, determined the right of a chief to his title, nor need he have title to an acre of ground. Some chiefs there are that have neither property nor jurisdiction, and the cutting off of the present chief does no more than make way for another. For Highland chiefs right to do right to the name sprang from a dawn of society before the writing of laws. So the difficulty of imposing the law on a race of tribesmen who had not the understanding or will to accept it was a matter of extreme concern to men like Duncan Forbes. For him, the rebellion and the constant feuding forays in the hills were sad obstacles to the progress of civilization. But to soldiers like Cumberland and his rough general of division, Henry Hawley, there was common sense in the argument that if men are all the better for a little blooding, so must nations be also. If the law and loyalty could not be brought into the hills by persuasion and argument, it must be brought by the musket, the bayonet and the gibbet. Still, Forbes persevered. It has been, for a great many years, impracticable, and hardly thought safe to try it, to give the law its course among the mountains. It required no small degree of courage, and a greater degree of power than men are generally possessed of, to arrest an offender or debtor in the midst of his clan. And for this reason, it was that the Crown in former times was obliged to put sheriff's ships and other jurisdictions in the hands of powerful families in the Highlands who by their respective clans and following could give execution to the laws within their several territories, and frequently did so at the expense of considerable bloodshed. Great chieftains, men ennobled by the crown, like the Campbells of Argyll and Bredaldin, were thus responsible for the law in the hills, and by the execution of it would have been less than men if they had not thereby increased their own power and property. They could put the greatest number of broadswords in the greatest number of hands and dress the settlement of ancient feuds in the livery of the king. The government had not solved the problem by acknowledging and confirming the hereditary jurisdictions of the chiefs. It had merely given quasi-legal authority to the primitive savagery of Highland life. Although, in 1746, Europe and America were within half a century of your evolution and the rights of man, North Britain still slumbered in tribal twilight 400 miles from London. The social system of a Highland clan was fixed and the barriers were crossed emotionally only. A chief's son, wet-nursed by the wife of a humbly, would never call his foster brother his equal. But the milk shared by them imposed a lifelong obligation that could and often did compel the one to give his life for the other. And if the compulsion were not strong enough, if the clansmen were reluctant to come out with sword and target when needed, the chief would feel himself justified in burning the roof of his milk brother's hut. The geography of their land determined the economy of the clans. It was and is a hard land. Before man, the moving floors of ice cut the glens and so flayed the earth of skin, that at its best the rock is covered by shallow soil. In such harsh and unrewarding surroundings, men could be herdsmen only, raising black and shaggy cattle, hardy sheep and goats, and being tribal herdsmen. They became warriors to protect their flocks until in the end history stood on its head and they were men of war rather than minders of cattle. Forays against the herds of their neighbours became affairs of honour and only the people south of the mountains saw it as robbery. A quarrel between men of different tribes might be settled by a dirk thrust at night, by single combat or by whole clans pulled out onto the heather by the fiery cross. 
one cattle raid would be answered by another, year after year, and the bards of the clans composed heroic poems about each bloody incident. The pipes played rants in honour of men dead for centuries. The land, once held by the tribe in common, had, by the 18th century, become the chiefs, his title to it sometimes no more tangible than the approval of his tribe, a situation that proved most awkward for some of them when the great chiefs of Argyle or Seafor for love it discovered that a sheet of sheepskin could be more effective weapon than a broadsword or a lochaber axe. Yet, though the land was the chiefs, the clan's interest in the soil was deep and strong. Part of it was mensal land, used by and for the chief himself. Parts too might be given in perpetuity to families of officials of the clan, men like the bard, the har harper and the piper. The rest was held by tenants under tax or leases granted by the chief. Thus the taxman, though not of the chief's family, was a man of importance in the tribal society and whose rank entitled him to be a junior officer or senior non-commissioned officer when the clan formed itself into a regiment for war. In their turn, the taxmen subleased part of their land, and so each social stratum was formed, each man owing economic allegiance to those above him, and all bound in fealty to the chieftain, whose direct and known progenitor had been the strong lined hero who had started the whole tribe. The chief was a man of contradictions, a civilised savage whose interests and experience were often far wider than most Englishmen's. He could speak Gaelic and English and very often French, Greek and Latin as well. He sent his sons to be educated at universities in Glasgow and Edinburgh, in Paris or Rome. He drank French claret and wore lace at his throat. He danced lightly, his own highland reels and southern measures. He swore oaths in which God and Celtic mythology were mixed. He would boast, as did the MacGregors, that Ryle was his race, or that he bore a king's name if, we, if he were an Appen Stuart. But his allegiance to kings was quixotic. In his glens he was king, and there was no appeal higher than to him among his clan. A woman was once brought before MacDonald of Clan Ranald and accused of stealing money from him. He ordered her to be tied by the hair to seaweed on the rocks, and there she stayed until the Atlantic tide rolled in and drowned her. Although Clan Ranald's people may have trembled at the violent justice of their chief, none could have questioned the punishment, for who stole from the chief stole from the clan. The chief protected the clan, and the chief punished the clan. At the best, offenders were driven from the glens. At the worst, they might be sold to the merchant captains who called at Inverness, looking for servants for the Americas. Seven years before Culloden, Sir Alexander MacDonald of Sleat and his brother-in-law MacLeod of Dunvegan, chiefs of the Isles, drove one hundred of their people aboard ships for deportation to Pennsylvania and swaggered their way out of the uproar this caused in the lowlands when the ship was discovered and the deportees released at an Irish port. No protest was heard or recorded from a, from a MacDonald or a MacLeod clansman. Although now and then a chief might whet his talents on the politics or society of the lowlands or England, most of them, once their youth was passed, stayed in their hills where they were not known by their surnames, but by their land, by the glen or loch or the strath or clacken that was their home. And the wife of a chief, whether or not her husband would have been plain mister in Glasgow or London, was always lady. A chief's amusement came from the land and the culture of his people, from bardic poems and wild pipe music. More actively, when he was not away on a cattle raid, he hunted. The high mountains at one time were running with the stag, the wolf and the cat. And the hunting of them was a fine and barbaric spectacle, even after the firearm came to the highlands. 
Sir Ewan Cameron of Lochiel, chief of a clan that was all gentlemen by its own estimates, once organised a splendid deer hunt for the pleasure of his guests. He called out hundreds of his men and stretched them over the hills at the head of Loch Arctic. They moved forward, shouting and crying, sounding the pipes and beating sword on shield, so that the deer bounded from cover and ran towards the mouth of a narrow glen. There stood Lochiel and his guests with broadswords in their hands. By the swinging and the cutting of the long blades, they slew many animals, and the Cameron Bard and the Cameron Harper made an epic of it. Taxmen and humblies, because they were blood of blood with Lochiel, felt that some of his valour and some of his pride was theirs too. So where he went, they would go, and if he passed by their door, they would have a plaid for his head and brown for his dogs. Lincoln Forbes, in his painstaking efforts to enlighten a usually obtuse government in London, once numbered the fighting men of the Highlands, naming them clan by clan, from MacDonald of Glencoe's 130 broadswords to the 4,000 well-armed kerns whom Campbells of Argyll and Campbell of Bradalbin could put into battle if they wished. Altogether, Forbes estimated that the warrior strength of the mountains was 31,930, and he regarded this as a conservative figure. Had all these found common cause, they could have tumbled the House of Hanover from the throne merely by assembling and marching down to Lowlands. Less than 6,000 advancing south to Derby under Prince Charles four months before Culloden had forced George II to think seriously of immediate retirement to Hanover. But, in fact, there had never been unity in the Highlands, nor could ever be. Religion, feuds, and political ambitions of chiefs, the natural jealousies of men who live remote and primitive lives, made common cause impossible. Each clan was enough to itself, and the world ended beyond the glen or with the sea that locked in the islands. The patriarchal system of clanship, the fact that there was never at one time more than half the people of the highlands profitably employed, the ancient stories of valour and combat, all fostered the warlike spirit of the clans. Thus a chief was judged by his attitude towards military matters by his courage and by his sensitivity in affairs of honour. As soon as a chief's son came to manhood, he was watched carefully by his father's people. If he were quick to revenge an insult by tugging out his dirk, if he were always ready to lead high-spirited young men on a cattle foray, then he was greatly esteemed and accepted as worthy to succeed his father. If, however, his brief encounter with softer living in the lowlands or on the continent had turned his mind to more sedentary interests, he would be despised, and the allegiance of the clan might turn to a younger brother. The milksop might remain the chief in name, none could take that from him, but hard sinews and a fine cunning in war were expected of the man who led the clan in battle. Every man and boy old enough or fit enough to carry arms was automatically a soldier in the regiment of the clan, his rank fixed by his social position. The chief, or that man of the chief's family named by him, was the colonel. The chief's brothers, or sons, commanded the flanks and the rear. The head of each family was an officer or a sergeant, bringing in his brothers, sons and tenants to form companies or platoons. Each family, too, stood in line of battle according to its importance in the clan, so that the common humbly, the raw-fied, half-naked subtenant of a subtenant, would find himself in the rear rank of all, and think it no more than his right. Brother fought beside brother, father by son, so that each might witness the other's courage and valour and find example in them. The clan gathered when the fiery cross was sent across its country. Two burnt or burning sticks, to which was tied a strip of linen stained with blood. The cross was passed from hand to hand by runners and relay. One of the last occasions on which it was sent 
was when Lord Glenorchy, son of Earl of Bredalbin, rallied his father's people against the Jacobite clans of 1745. It travelled 32 miles about Loch Tay in three hours. A clan that had been gathered by the cross was moved by deep and distant superstitions. An armed man it met with by the way was a portent of good fortune and victory. A stag, fox, hare, or any beast of game that was seen and not killed promised evil. If a barefooted woman crossed the road before the marching men, she was seized and blood was drawn from her forehead by the point of a knife. All this and more. Every tribe had its slogan, a wild and savage exhortation to slaughter or a reminder of the heroic past. It was cried for the onslaught and the confusion of a night alarm. And it was as much a part of the clan's identity as the badge of heather, gale, ling, oak or myrtle that a man wore in his bonnet. The slogan was yelled, the rant played and the badge worn, be it for a battle such as that now facing the Jacobite clans, or for a dark of night creek when young men fell upon a neighbour's cattle and sheep. Because there were no laws to protect the clan against the chief's rights, the past had established a compensating balance. If he had the right of life and death over his people, he was equally responsible for their welfare, and most chiefs honoured this obligation. As landlord, father figure, judge and general at arms, his power was great, but it was not always absolute, and on occasions he would debate major issues with the leading members of his family and clan. The settlement of serious disputes between one man and another, the support of children orphaned, the declaration of war and the acceptance of terms for peace. This was something from the tribe's past, when men held things in common and there were chiefs who felt themselves strong enough in their feudal power to disregard it. They would not ask their council's advice or would ignore it if they did, and if they felt their fellow following among the clan to be weak, they would burn a few cottages to encourage the laggards from boyhood, from the moment his foster mother waned him. A highland chief began to understand, or at least to enjoy, his peculiar position in life. He was of the same blood and name and descent as his people, but he stood halfway between them and God. His prosperity or poverty depended upon the industry of his clan, and it would have been unnatural if all chiefs recognised this in terms of their responsibility towards their people. A chief's tenants, taxmen and humblies, followed his standard, avenged his wrongs, supplied his table with the produce of their crofts, reaped his corn, cut his fuel. They paid their rents to him loyally, even when he was an outlaw or an exile. For nine years after Culloden, Macpherson of Cluny lived in a cave on his mountains, nourished by his clan and protected from the soldiers. A chief was not distinguished by the degree of his fortune or by the splendour of his dress, but some walked like peacocks in tartan and silver. His power and importance rested in the cattle on his brace and in the number of pretty fellows he could have in his tail when he went abroad. Fusted a MacDonald of Kepic boasts that his rent roll was 500 fighting men. In such a climate of pride and sensitive honour, the hospitality of the Highlands was more often manifest vanity. When this same Kepich was told by a guest of the great Candelabra to be seen in the houses of England, he winged his table with tall clansmen, each holding aloft a flaming pine knot. Kepich grinned at his guest and asked where in England, France or Italy was there a house with such candlesticks. Edward Burt was a heavy-footed Englishman with no sense of humour but a rewarding taste for sociology. He went to the Highlands early in the 18th century to help Marshall Wade build his civilising roads 
and he found the pride of the Highland Chiefs quaintly archaic and faintly alarming. I happened to be at the house of a certain chief when the chieftain of another tribe came to make a visit. I told him I thought some of his people had not behaved towards me with that civility I expected of the clan. He started, clapped his hands to his broadsword and said if I required it, he would send me two or three of their heads. I laughed, thinking of it a joke, but the chief insisted he was a man of his word. Honour was honour. It clothed a man better than a fine jacket before the eyes of his neighbours, and the heads of three of his tribe were well expended if they kept a chief decent. Bert must have talked the Highlander out of the bloody offer, for he does not say that he received the heads, but he too was meticulous, too meticulous a chronicler to have ignored the fact. He had a bumbling respect for this primitive code of honour, and for the simple and barbaric ways in which the Highlanders gave their word on any sacred matter. This oath they take upon a thick this oath they take upon a drawn dirk which they kiss in a solemn manner, consenting if ever they prove perjured to be stabbed with the same weapon. And while like a good civilized Englishman he deplored the mountain habit of cattle lifting, I cannot approve of the lowland saying, Show me a Highlander, and I will show you a thief. I do not remember that ever I lost anything among them but a pair of doe skin gloves. Another Englishman who was inclined to accept the Highlander's claims to gentility was Daniel Defoe. We see every day the gentlemen born here, such as the Mackenzies, Macleans, Dundonalds, Gordons, Mackays, and others who are named among the clans as if they were barbarians, appear at court and in our camps and armies as polite and as finished gentlemen as any from other countries or even among our own. And if I should say, outdoing our own in many things, especially in arms and gallantry, as well as abroad as at home. Any Mackenzie or Mackay would have agreed that Defoe was giving them no more than their due. Edward Burt studied the clans more closely than Defoe and saw more of the common people among them, and in all that he wrote of them there is curiosity and distaste. I wonder that such a society should exist on one island with men as civilised and as humane as Edward Burt. He never fully understood the peculiar relationship that existed between chief and tribesmen. The ordinary Highlanders esteem it the most sublime degree of virtue to love their chief and pay him a blind obedience, although it be in opposition to the government, the laws of the kingdom, or even the law of God. He is their idol. And as they profess to know no king but him, I was going further, so will they say they ought to do whatever he commands. On the other hand, the love and veneration of his clan was sometimes a trial to the chief, since he was expected to behave at all times with superior courage and superlative hardihood. Bert tells a story of a chief who was once taking his men over the hills in a winter foray against another clan. The raids sheltered for the night in a high quarry, and when the chief rolled snow into a ball, placing it beneath his head for a pillow, his followers looked sourly at him and murmured among themselves, Now we despair of victory, since our leader has become so effeminate he cannot sleep without a pillow. Bert also left on record the picture of a Highland chief making a peaceful voyage abroad from his glens, a proud strutting fellow with his wealth and honour in his tail. The tail was a raggle taggle of clansmen, each as prickly proud as the man at their head. First the chief's henchman, his immediate bodyguard and his foster brother, joined to him by the mystic union of one woman's breast milk. Next came the bard, a man with his own peculiar pride and honour, since on his skill and invention rested the chief's only hope for immortality. 
Bardship was hereditary and carried with it a grant of land. The Highlands had no written history and a man's reputation and memory might mount or fall on the tongue of the bard. The songster of the clan was really a warrior. The fellow could not have time for the broadsword and the epic poem at one moment. He sat on a hillock when the clan went into its charge, noting individual valour and keeping a particular and critical eye on the chief and his family. He was also the clan's principal genealogist and, if set to it, could outmatch the book of Genesis. All clansmen had the hit this taste for naming the begotten of those who were begat. They have a pride in their family, said Bert with wonder. Almost everyone is a genealogist. Behind the bard came the piper, ready to fill his bag and finger his chanter at a nod from the chief. He too was a gentleman among gentlemen, who held his post from his favour and who came from a long line of pipers. His name could sometimes live longer than the chief he served. The greatest of all pipers in all the highlands were the Macrimmons, who could make men weep or fight like the gods, just like an inflated bag and a flute of bone. The piper sat on no hill when the clan was for the onslaught, that marched behind the chief with the drone spread and his wild music calling up the rant and the red reminders of past valour. Fourth in the tale was the bladier, the chief spokesman, a silver-voiced man of debate and argument who knew each precedent in every quarrel and every promise in each dispute and who took from the chief's shoulders the arduous responsibility of compliment and inquiry before the claret was poured and the board cleared, and behind these four was a gilly to carry the chief's broadsword and buckler, and ever to carry him over fords if his brogues were new, and his hose of silk, a third to take his bridle on rough hill paths, and yet another to carry his baggage. To some chiefs, even this wild tale would not be enough to impress his neighbours with his importance. Behind might come a dozen swordsmen, axemen, bowmen or musketmen, with pelted, belted plaid and naked thighs, and whomsoever the chief visited would house, bed and feed this wild and touchy tail without protest, knowing that next time it would be his turn. To Englishmen, Unfortunate enough to find themselves abroad in the Highlands or to Lowlanders confronted on the Glasgow cobbles by Highlandmen, the most savage and outlandish thing about the Highlandmen was their dress. Bert attempted a description of it, stepping none too certainly across the stones of objective reporting and disgust. The common habit of the Highlander is far from being acceptable to the eye. With them a small part of the plaid, which is not so large as the former, is set in folds and girt round the waist, to make of it a shawl petticoat, short petticoat that reaches halfway down the thigh. The rest is brought over the shoulders and fastened before, below the neck, often with a fork, and sometimes with a bodkin or sharpened piece of stick, so that they make pretty nearly the appearance of the poor women in London, when they bring their gowns over their heads to shelter themselves from the rain. This dress is called the quilt, and for the most part they wear the petticoat so very short that in a windy day, going up a hill or stooping, the indecency of it is plainly discovered. He illustrated what he meant with a story of a lowland lady of his acquaintance, who had followed a highland gilly up a hill in a strong wind. The strong, the long plaid, which could be belted into a kilt and draped over the shoulders in a shawl, was the poor highlandman's only dress. Elaborations were for his betters, and when gentlemen of a high degree dressed themselves in splendours, it was with a savage and vivid magnificence. A chief, since he preferred to ride a shelty rather than walk, were trues of skin-tight tartan and not the kilt. 
His hair was tied back with a ribbon and powdered if he had acquired the fashion abroad. His bonnet was trimmed with the eagle feather that marked his rank and he wore a tartan jacket and a tartan waistcoat, a tartan plaid that fell from the silver and cairngorm brooch on his left shoulder. If he chose to wear the kilt and not the trues, a silver and leather spurn hung from his waist and his calves were covered to the knee. With hose of tartan fret, tartan from shoulder to brogues, played kilt and stockings often of a different set, so that his clothes burned and glowed with green and yellow, blue and scarlet. He armed himself with a claw-handed steel pistol. He armed himself with claw-handled steel pistols, known as Highland Dags, two of them dangling from his belt. His round bull-hide target was studded with silver bosses and was frequently mounted with a steel spike 12 inches long. On one hip he carried a basket-hilted broadsword double-edged, a yard long and two inches wide. On the other he wore his dirk, its haft richly worked with silver, its scabbard pouched for knife and fork. Thrust into the top of his hose on one calf was a tiny black knife, and thus he stood in magnificence. A savage man who might speak French and Latin, who could distinguish between a good claret and a bad, who believed in the blood feud and the holy trinity who would bargain like an Edinburgh chandler to secure a profitable marriage for his daughter, who could sell his tenants to the plantations, but who would touch his sword at the slightest reflection on his honour. A man of wild and ridiculous poetry, harsh and remorseless principle, and a man who was, by 1746, an uncomfortable anachronism. They walk nimbly, said Bert, with a kind of stateliness in the midst of their poverty. And it was the wretched and squalid poverty of the Highlands that most impressed visitors from the south. Where villages existed, there were nothing like the aged stone and orderly thatch of England. They were, to Bert, like so many heaps of mud when seen from a distance down the glen. Mean cottages of sod, heather and stone, each consisting of one room only divided by a wicker curtain in the middle of this room. A peat fire smoked beneath an iron cooking pot. About the fire and the pot, the inhabitants crouched listlessly during the winter nights. They have no diversions to amuse them, but sit brooding in the smoke of their fire till their legs and thighs are scorched to an extraordinary degree. To supply want of candles, they provide themselves with a quantity of sticks of fir, the most resinous being lightened and laid on stones. As in any tribal society, the women did most of the work. The men were indolent, according to Bert, and sat by their fires talking of past forays, creating the smoke of godlike images of their inspiring ancestors. The offer of an inquiry into the causes that facilitate the use and progress of rebellions in Scotland thought that he had found one cause in the fact that half of the Highlandmen were without work of any kind. That is what an Englishman would regard as work. Many, he said, are supported by the bounty of their acquaintances or friends and relations. Others get their living by levying blackmail and the rest by stealing. The blackmail was the old Scots tradition of demanding mail or tribute at the point of a sword. Lowland farmers living on the edge of the highland paid it hopefully, if not graciously, in return for the safety of their cattle. A community that scraped the barest living from the hard hills lived a pendulum existence between semi-starvation and glutinous feasts. On the braes about and above a highland village grazed great herds of black cattle, tiny shaggy ponies belonging to the taxmen. Wooden ploughs broke bitter furrows across the stony earth in which the people grew their corn. When times were bad, when food was scarce, they bled their cattle at the throat and mixed the blood with oatmeal into little cakes that could be fried. But for, for all but the sons of chiefs and prosperous taxmen, there was no schooling, <clears throat> nor did the people need any. In their pipes, their songs and bardic legends, they had a hard and 
relevant culture that matched and explained their life to them. Their Irish tongue sang sweetly on their lips and spoke their emotions through its lilting cadences. God had found a way into the mountains long before Christianity came to the south and had declared an amicable armistice with the Celtic mythology of giants, witches, precognition and stones that spoke with the voices of men. As with all barbaric peoples, there was something in their savagery that stirred the imagination of more civilised man and would leave him restless until he could take it and turn it into sentimental romance. This is what he did with the party-coloured cloth which the Highlanders wore and which they called the Brechan. Before the 19th century, it is doubtful whether any one particular set, one pattern, had a more casual connection with one clan or family. This was the romantic nonsense to be invented later. A Highlander's name, his clan, his tribal allegiance were declared by the slogan he shouted in battle, by the sprig of plant he wore in his bonnet or tied to the staff of his standard. Each plant had its mystic meaning, was a charm against witchcraft and disaster, or had its origin in the sober utilities of life like the badge of the MacNeils. This was the seaweed, and it was with seaweed that the MacNeils manured the barren fields of their western islands. Such a society, feudal and tribal, accepting the dynastic rule of absolute chieftainship, believing in the redressal of family wrongs, but above all, such a military society was inevitably the one to which the exiled House of Stuart would appeal for support. The Stuarts had been Scottish kings before the new union of the kingdoms. And although to most clansmen kings meant less than their chiefs, a Scottish king made more sense than a German. The Stuart concept of the rights and privileges of kingship dif differed in degree only from the Highland principle of clan leadership. So a clansman could, with less difficulty than a Suffolk farmer, sympathise with a young man who landed on the Inverness coast, asking for the restoration of his rights. There were other contributory factors. There was, of course, politics and, to many chiefs, the Act of Union, which had joined England and Scotland under one Parliament, was still a betrayal. For while the Parliament of Scotland sat in session, they had shown little respect for it. And there was religion, camp follower in most wars. The Reformation and the joyless teaching of John Knox had touched the Highlands. The Kirk and the Law walking hand in hand through some of the glens in the Campbell country of Argyle, for example. But most of the clans were tolerant Protestants or defiant Catholics, and the latter were bound to have sympathy for a Catholic prince come back from exile. Non-durancy was strong among the Protestant clans of the West, the Camerons and the Stuarts of Appen. They were a dissident sect, and their clergy had been ordained by the bishops who had refused to take the oath of allegiance to the new kings once the Stuarts were driven into exile, arguing that an oath to one was not transferable to another. Religion was not an issue in the Highlands until the South made it so. There were Catholic clans with Protestant chiefs, non-Durant meeting houses on the lands of the Durants, the Chisholms of Struff Glass, the people of the Gordon country, the MacNeils of Barra, some MacDonald men of Glengarry and Glencoe were Catholics, with the significance of the Mass and Confession laced tightly into their own peculiar notions of man and his purpose. In 1745, the Catholic Church was very busy in the Highlands. Fourteen years before, Hugh MacDonald of Morar, stepbrother to the chief, had come from Rome as vicar apostolic 
to the Highlands. Dispatched thereto by the Pope and with his holiness's particular blessing. He came with a little band of priests, all Highland men born of chief or taxmen. He came to open seminaries for the training of boys to the priesthood, to say mass in the ruined churches of Badenoch once more. And all this he organised from his island headquarters in Marar, now and then travelling about his scattered parish disguised in plaid and bonnet. Catholics and non-jurors mixed with a tolerance that might have deeply disturbed his holiness, but which certainly made Whig clans like the Campbells twitch nervously at the scent of idolatry and treason. For the suspicion of treason they had cause. Bishop Hugh welcomed Prince Charles when he landed, and having found that the young man was determined to stay, blessed his standard for the battles to come. Where there were deep glens protected by the broadsword or the earth itself, Catholicism flourished. In the Chaber it was due to Father John MacDonald, known as Maester Ian Moore, a holy man whose ancestors had been warrior chiefs of Clan Ranald. He had been in the Chaber for a quarter of a century before the prince arrived. In of Glass, the Chisholm country, Father John Farquharson dressed in kilt and played for, for the common days of the week, but on Sundays he put on sacerdotals to celebrate Mass in the old meeting house at Ballanhoon. The government knew he was there and made some attempt to root him out, dispatching the soldiers one day and catching him at the altar, but his congregation took arms against them would have killed them and buried them beneath the floor of the church, had not Father John argued against it. The soldiers did not come again until after the 45, and until then the Father went on celebrating the Mass and baptising the newborn of the Chisholms from a natural font in the rocks. There were other priests, James Grant and Barra, Alexander Forrester of the Scots College in Rome who came to South Uist, Aeneas MacLachan in Cnoidart, Alexander Cameron, Catholic brother to Protestant Lachiel, who came to the Caber. The great Catholic centre was Scallon in Glenlivet, 1,500 feet above sea level. If the waters of Glenlivet were later to give Scotland a fine whisky in the 18th century, it was the place from which it was hoped that the true faith might once more grow and flower. There, on the Crombie Burn, was a little seminary training a dozen or two dozen Highland boys for eventual graduation to Catholic colleges abroad. Several times before the rebellion of 1745, soldiers came to the Glen and burnt the seminary and the cottages, but each time Bishop Hugh's priest put stone upon stone again and continued with their work and their prayers, living a harsh and comfortless life in their house beside the burn. When the Catholic prince landed with his seven followers and told those chiefs who bluntly advised him to return home that he had come home, the Catholic priests of the Catholic glens became his enthusiastic recruiting sergeants. Father William Duffy Father William Duffy, a one-time Episcopalian minister, but now superior at Scallon Seminary, sent a message of joyous exhortation to all Catholics in the Highlands, urging them to join the Prince. Some priests set an example, belting on broadsword and dirk and joining the clan regiments as chaplains with the rank of captain. In Gordon country, others got into the saddle with pistol and riding boots to trot with the tenantry of the Duke's lands. In Strathaven, Father Grant and Father Tiri cast lots between them to see which might have the honour of going to war with their communicants, and which the disappointment of staying at home Father Tiri won and went off to march to Derby and to stand in line with sword and target when it all ended at Culloden. The whole melancholy affair was a confusion of politics and religion, tribal loyalties and clan jealousies. Brother fought brother because of disagreements over the Act of Union, 
and co-religionists took arms in opposition because of their preference for this king or that. The English were involved as the principal military force and the parliament of the kingdom because it represented the law and challenge, but the Scots engaged themselves in a bitter civil war over a young man whose grandfather had been king sixty years before. Honour, even Highland honour, was capable of cunning interpretation as father stayed at home and sent one son to fight for King George and the other for King James, thereby securing their estates whatever happened. Few were like Donald Cameron, younger of Lochiel, who committed everything he had, clan, family and property, to the cause of the red-haired young man whom he had earlier advised against coming. When that young man landed eight months before Culloden, the chiefs, for all their Jacobitism, non-durance here, Catholicism, were reluctant to come out. It was nearly thirty years since the clans had last taken to the heather. Old issues had become mildewed, old passions tired, and the hope for armed support in England was something a madman would dream. The boy's army, when he finally gathered one, was never more than a few thousand of those thirty thousand clansmen of the mountains. Drawn there by chiefs, charmed by his nature, or committed by rash promises, the other chiefs remained in their hills, fingers still smarting from the last burning they had received in the Stuart cause, or else they allowed a few of their clan to go out as a gamble, while blandly disowning the rascals to the government. And the clansmen, they came out when told, most of them pulling broadswords from the sod where they had been hidden since the disarming acts that followed the last rebellion. They dug up lochaber axes and steel dirks, they primed muskets and dags and told their wives to watch the winter fields. They came out through no particular attachment to the Stuart cause, and their approval of the prince, when he put himself ahead of them in trues and played, was personal rather than political. They came out because their chiefs called them, and this not always willingly. Romance, lusting after fact, conceived a picture of the Highlandmen springing to arms like a stag from the heather as soon as they heard what the bonny laddie had come to their hills. Bowland ladies, writing sad songs thirty years later, when the bonny laddie was a middle-aged man in drink, were responsible. The number of clansmen who came out reluctantly and under duress was probably a minority but it was sizable enough to show both the character of Highland society and the sad waste of it. When the government had thousands of Jacobite prisoners in jails from Perth to Carlisle, from York to London, many of them advanced as a plea for mercy, proof that they had been forced into service by their chiefs. The plea was largely rejected, the court arguing that, so far as they could see, there had been nothing to stop a man running away when once forced out. This argument reasonable enough to an Englishman, was ridiculous within the context of Highland society, for where could a clansman run once he had disobeyed his chief? The common persuasion used to bring a man out with the clan regiment was the threat to burn his roof over his head, a threat that was put into effect where necessary. This made, for many of them, the rebellion a choice between two evils, Along Speyside, able-bodied men were told that their cottages would be burned if they did not answer Lord Lewis Gordon's demand for recruits. If they did answer, then their houses were most certainly burned when the Duke of Cumberland's soldiers passed that way. After the rebellion was over, the Reverend James Robertson wrote a humble petition asking mercy for 15 of his parish at Loch Broom, then lying in prison at Tilbury in the Thames. He said that in March, MacDonald of Kepic had come by, snatching men from their beds and dragging them from their ploughs. One I did myself see overtaken, and when he declared he would rather die than be carried to rebellion, was knocked to the ground by the butt of a musket and carried away all blood. Another minister, Mr Gordon of Alvey, declared in petition that of 43 of his parishioners, who went away to join the prince, three only could be said to have volunteered for the adventure. The rest had been forced by the burning of their houses, by the slaughtering of their cattle, and by the breaking of their heads. Donald Cameron, the genteel Lochiel of Jacobite romance, was indeed a man of honour and sensibility, but he was also a Highland chief. 
In August of 1745, when Lochiel had committed his clan to the prince, several taxmen of his estates went from house to house through Rannoch to intimate to all the Camerons that if they did not forego if they did not forthwith go with them, they would all instantly proceed to burn all their houses and hush their cattle. Whereupon they carried off the Rannoch men, all of them, about 100, mostly of the name Cameron. Some weeks later, according to the deposition made by clansmen before the authorities in Edinburgh, Lachiel's brother, Dr Archibald Cameron, passed through Cameron County, declaring to all men of the chief's name that if they did not come off directly, he would burn their houses and cut them in pieces. Before the same authorities, and on the same day, another Cameron clansman declared that he had been forced out in this way, and that when he and some of his comrades had tried to escape service with the Prince Lachiel, beat them severely with his whip. Yet a third Cameron deposed that he had consented to go out only after four of his cows had been killed by Dr Cameron. The chief and the taxman who beat up their following in this manner saw no wrong in it, for within the context of the chief it was the reluctant Cameron who sinned and betrayed his ancestors. A chief's declaration of war agreed to by his elders and his taxman was binding on all the clan and disobedience was dishonour. But the fact of such frequent enforcement marks the common suffering and the common indifference to the political issues between the pressed clansman and the pressed soldier of King George. But forced or not, the clansmen who stood on Dramossi Moor that Wednesday were on the last defensive, standing in arms for a society that was now as obsolescent as a cause of the young man who had brought them there, their furious valour, the wild charge which was their only battle tactic had taken the Jacobite cause down into the heart of England before the impetus died and its leaders found themselves like dreamwalkers awoken on a windowsill. Through the winter the retreat had continued back to the hills, a battle flung and won against Holly's unsuspecting camp at Falkirk and then they retreat northwards again with the young Duke of Cumberland in pursuit northwards and still northwards the winter passing into spring and then a final decision in a final battle 